This is The Dragon's Roar by Priestess of Groove, narrated by Riley Rocks. Chapter 48 Amen 15 Amen stood looking out over his balcony in the king's quarters, a now favorite pastime. The brutal heat of King's Landing relented for once, and a cool ocean breeze ruffled his hair as he breathed in the salty air. The world felt like it had taken a surreal quality in the last four days since they had returned from Dragonstone. The ocean and sky both appeared far too blue and cheerful. The seas were calm, and the keep was quiet. The scenery was in odd contrast to the turmoil inside him. He had come back to King's Landing with two letters from the Night's Watch, waiting for him, and he nearly tore them in two in his haste. He sank to the floor in shock as he read the news. King Aemon Targaryen, first of his name, and the first men. I'm delighted to inform you that your uncle Benjamin Stark has returned from his exploration into the far north bearing a gift of news of great import. Craster has been executed. As per your advice, he was discovered to be sacrificing the son of a daughter-wife. The child was rescued, but unfortunately succumbed to the cold. Craster was beheaded, and now his daughter-wives are running the household. They will be left in peace for the time being. Mance Radar, the king beyond the wall, was intrigued by your letter, and is interested in a meeting. He will begin to move all of the clans further south, closer to the wall to facilitate your meeting. No doubt, the stranger's burden Benjamin brought back is a living being that looks like a deceased wildling. Its eyes glow blue, and it struggles against its bonds. This is the white you were talking about? The Night King is responsible for this abomination? May the old gods have mercy on us. I understand you wish someone to escort this creature south to show it to the southern lords. I will arrange for a ship to leave Eastwatch by the sea with an escort for the creature. I received a letter recently from you that you have a wealth of prisoners bound for the wall. We look forward to adding more trained members to our ranks. Sir Barros Blount and Sir Mandon Moore have been commendable assets in our time of need. Jura Mormont, 997th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Eamon took a moment to breathe as he absorbed the news. His Uncle Benjamin survived, after all, and he had a white. He didn't expect all of the southern lords to fall in line immediately, but he imagined it would do a great deal to align the other lord's interests with his. They would finally be able to prepare once they knew what was at stake. However, he knew it would be some time before they saw the white. It had taken two months sailing in the time before, and they had taken the white back to Eastwatch by the sea. Whereas, it seems that Benjamin brought the white back to Castle Black. There was still quite a lot of waiting to be done but he could finally take his first steps towards preparing the kingdoms for war against the Long Night. The next letter was from his great-uncle, Maester Aemon. He felt a pang when he recognized the beautiful writing of Samwell Tarly, no doubt transcribing on behalf of his uncle. King Aemon, first of his name and the first men. When we last spoke, you were an earnest young man, driven to unite the Seven Kingdoms. I am so proud of what you have accomplished in your short time as king. You show a clear-headed calculation, and planning that reminds me of your father. He would be proud. On that note, I do not think I need to caution you in some of your more spurious interests. You know what happened to your father. Do not pursue these passions— to the point of neglecting your role as king or your allies. Some things may never be, and that is okay. I am sure you are aware of what happened the last time Targaryens attempted to hatch dragon eggs. It led to the tragedy at Summerhall, 
were your great-great-grandfather, King Aegon V, my brother, attempted to hatch the eggs. Your father was born the same day the tragedy struck. As I was a maester by that time, I have little knowledge of the exact events. However, your grandfather seems certain that the key to hatching dragons lies in the Targaryen house words, fire and blood. One maester, Galadine, recalled pyromancers being present for the egg hatching. The eggs received both their fire and blood and failed to hatch. But this presumes that the eggs were real, and either not dead or merely replicas. I have my doubts about their legitimacy. I do believe my brother, King Aegon V, may have become touched in the head as he aged, and it is possible he was sold a lie when it came into the possession of his eggs. As you are sound of mind, your description of the egg suggests to me that it may in fact be real, as that is unlike anything I've ever seen or heard. There are accounts from past Targaryens when dragons still roam the lands that describe eggs like the one you mentioned. Read up what you can on dragons, your grace. Plan just as carefully this hatchling as you did your alliances to the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. There is one, Maester Marwyn, who has an ongoing interest in dragons and the magic they bring into the world. I recommend you summon him to King's Landing. He is not your average maester. He seeks only the knowledge regarding dragons and to foster it. I am afraid you cannot rely on him, either for your healing or your counsel for governing. Long may you reign. Maester Amon of Castle Black He felt his heart racing and glanced over at the egg, still sitting in the fire grate. He had been both disappointed and relieved to discover the dragon had yet to hatch. It was important that he be there for the hatchling, but did it mean the heralding of the Red Comet was likely not responsible for hatching Daenerys' dragons? Perhaps her hatching was by good fortune alone. Fire and blood, he thought. He could see why his great-great-grandfather, King Aegon V, would hold those words as the key, seeing as there was little else to go by. He had, in fact, introduced the research opportunity to Tyrion, who took the project with gusto and was happily in the library drawing up a report of what he could find. Mr. Marwyn. He had not heard of this fellow from the time before. He would have to make inquiries. Even if Marwyn had little clue about hatching eggs, he would have better information about tending to and raising dragons. The next event of note that had happened since his return to the keep was the arrival of his cousin's betrothed, Marjorie Tyrell. He had waited outside in the courtyard with Ghost, Rob, Greywin, his uncle Ned, and her family, excluding Sir Loris. He was still confined to their apartments. It was difficult to hide his amusement at Rob's obvious nervousness as he shifted from one foot to another. He also went back and forth in a loop, but whether to clasp his hands in the front or the back, before finally settling on the back. Her carriage was almost as ornate as Queen Cersei's when she arrived at Winterfell, with scrolls and designs carved in the filigree. Unlike Cersei, when she stepped out, her smile lit up the keep, and there was a palpable excitement in her stroll. She wasted no time in waiting for her cousins to unload, and dropped into a deep curtsy in front of him. "'Your Grace, I am humbled and honored to finally meet you. Word of your success has already reached all corners of the Seven Kingdoms. I am impressed at your cunning, and enjoy it to unite the Seven Kingdoms bloodlessly. Such an accomplishment is unheard of,' she said in an awed voice. Eamon struggled to keep from smiling. He'd heard Marjorie Tyrell was beautiful, but he felt even that the words failed to encompass her stunning contents. While he would agree with her beauty, he was still grateful to not be marrying her. Though her compliments were welcome, they were too flowery. He would describe them as deliberately disarming, and she appeared about as vacuous as Sansa had before she lost her innocence. By contrast, 
he had left his first encounter with Danny under the distinct idea that he had done nothing to impress her. Compared to her accomplishments at the same age and under more trying circumstances, Danny had risen to queen without it being granted to her. Eamon had felt diminutive and had fostered in him an ache to prove himself. Rise, Lady Marjorie, and welcome to King's Landing, Eamon replied, taking her hand and planting a kiss on it with a smile. Next to him, Rob had been standing stiff as a startled deer, and then wilted as Marjorie showered her king with compliments. However, his smile returned as soon as she turned her attention to him, and she beamed. Lord Rob, isn't it? Lord Jamie did not lie. You do have the Tully looks. You're as handsome as your cousin the king. Rob drew himself up, and also planted a kiss on her hand. My lady, you're as radiant as the sun. Lord Jamie's description of you does not do you justice. Eamon gave his cousin a startled look. Jamie, waxing poetic about a woman's beauty? I think not. You must have heard that from elsewhere, cousin. It was difficult to contain his laughter when Rob pursed his lips at him in annoyance. He couldn't say anything against his king out of propriety, and even his scathing look was tame. Marjorie laughed. <laughs> now, who is this? Marjorie asked, looking down at Greywind. This is my direwolf, Greywind. He's gentle, I promise. Hold your hand out to him. The direwolf was panting placidly. He gave her a courtesy sniff and licked her hand. <laughs> what a charming wolf. It's so fascinating meeting a beast that's your house sigil. Sometimes I wish our sigil was an animal. Maybe a horse or a bird. Well, your house sigil will be an animal once we marry. I look forward to it, Lord Rob. She moved on to the next man. Lord Stark, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. The whole kingdom knows of your honor. It was a great and courageous thing to protect your nephew. I'm sure the gods, new and old, both understand, as we would not be enjoying this unprecedented time of peace otherwise. Uncle Ned was startled, but then smiled and said, Thank you for your kind words, Lady Marjorie. Winterfell and the North look forward to your presence. This winter may be chill, but I hope you will find our hearts warm. You are too kind, Lord Stark, she said with a small curtsy. Father! Brother! She finally walked over and embraced them both. Willis! You appear to be thriving in King's Landing. It gladdens my heart to see you, sister. I hope the journey wasn't too arduous. I had my cousins to keep me entertained. What do you think I was referring to? Willis said as she laughed merrily once more. Ah, here's the new young king. An old woman dressed in finery ambled over to them. She curtsied to the best of her ability, but eyed him like she was inspecting the authenticity of a gemstone. Your grace, it pleases me to finally meet you. There are too many men who first reach for the sword. I would also like to commend you on uniting the seven kingdoms bloodlessly. Thank you, my lady, Eamon said with a cautious smile. Ah, where are my manners? I am Lady Olena Tyrell, the mother of the fat one there. She pointed to her son, who swelled in indignation. It was a struggle to keep from laughing. A pleasure, my lady. I hope your trip was uneventful, and that you find rest and enjoyment here in the keep. Thank you, your grace. Now, let's see here. You're Rob Stark? Not bad. You have the telly eyes and hair. A handsome lad, Marjorie. You could do worse. You Starks have a reputation? I don't think I need to tell you, but I expect my granddaughter to be treated with the respect due to a lady. Understand? Uh, yes, my, my lady. I assure you, she will be in good hands. Rob's eyes bulged in alarm, but he took her hand all the same and planted a kiss on the back of it. Marjorie laughed. "'Grandmother, please. I'm sure Rob will treat me like a queen. Isn't that right?' "'Of course, my lady. Would you care for a walk in the gardens?' Rob asked, 
his hand held out to her. I would be delighted, she said with a wide smile. By your leave, your grace? He waved them along, staring at them. They already look like lovesick fools. He hoped he didn't look quite that moon-eyed when he finally met Daenerys, and he was certain he would do a better job of keeping his dignity. It really hadn't been love at first sight, thankfully. They had grown to appreciate one another. She will be a spark of warmth for the North in the long winter. I thank you for the alliance made this marriage possible, his uncle said, turning to him. They do appear to be a perfect match, Eamon replied. Lord Mace Tyrell puffed up. Indeed. I am most satisfied with this arrangement. I think it will be most beneficial for both parties, your grace. What I care about is my sister being happy. I've spoken with Rob a number of times, and he appears to be a thoughtful, earnest young man who will treat Marjorie well, Willis said. I know she will be in good hands. Oh, please, you sound like a bunch of preening roosters. I have better things to do than listen to you, Gladhead. You there, don't keep an old woman waiting. It's time for a luncheon. He dismissed himself and laughed quietly. She was just as feisty as Jamie had told him. He wondered briefly what a meeting between her and little Liana Mormont would be like. His smile fell away as he thought of yet another wild girl with a sharp tongue. Arya was little more than a week out, and then she would finally arrive. He hoped that perhaps she might have forgiven him for his audacity, but knowing Arya, it was a vain hope. But soon he would have the chance to set things right by informing her that her betrothal was broken. With any luck, he would be able to return that mischievous smile to her face in a matter of days. He was pleased to see his uncle and the Tyrells getting along, and hoped that for the rest of the North would embrace the future Lord Paramount's bride with equal enthusiasm. It did not escape him that Lady Catelyn had, and continued, to feel the bite of a cold welcome. Perhaps her ire towards him wasn't all her fault, but she still had a choice in how she treated him. Aemon excused himself and headed to the God's Wood. He struggled to keep his head up, but he felt a pang in his heart. Not even when he had been in Dragonstone had he felt the pain of heartsick so acutely. Seeing Rob and Marjorie's happiness made him ache for Danny, and he had no news regarding her well-being at all. What little they knew from Varys was three months old at best, and if anything, had followed as last time. Then she would be suffering from great losses at this moment, and he was not there to assist and comfort her. He prayed for her safety in front of the heart tree, and that Sir Barristan reached her with all haste. It had only been a month since the old knight had left on his quest, and it was estimated it would take nearly three months to reach Carth alone. Back in his quarters, he paced. Ghost watched him from atop the bed, panting in the heat. Eamon glared at the egg sitting in the fire grate, willing it to give him the answers he so desperately sought. A knock drew his and Ghost's attention. Your Grace, Lord Alexandros has arrived, Sir Marin Trant said through the door. Let him in. The musician appeared a little bright-eyed and walked cautiously into the room. He stepped just inside the door, bowed, and said, you summoned me, Your Grace? Yes, thank you for coming. You need not worry. It's for a harmless reason. Eamon replied with a chuckle. Cyrus's nervousness melted away immediately, and he bowed his head again. How may I serve you, Your Grace? Lord Jamie tells me you're interested in my father's harp. There was clear anxiety in his eyes, but he kept it under his control. I rescued it from the Ironborn that attacked him. I had no I had no way of knowing it was yours. I apologize, Your Grace. You gave it back. That's what matters. But he seemed to be under the impression that you could play it. Uh, y yes, Your Grace. I'm fluent in all major string instruments. Uh, harp, lute, cello, violina, and bass. Would you be willing to play my father's harp for me? I've never heard it. 
The surprise and awe dawned on Cyrus, like his only wish had come true. I would be glad to, Your Grace. Eamon pulled the case out from under his bed and handed it to him. He watched as the musician ran his hands over the case, before popping the latch and opening it. Cyrus glanced at him again, as though asking permission, and then at a nod, he pulled out the harp and plucked each of the strings. Eamon winced and felt his heart shudder at the warped sound. It had just been restrung. Surely its strings weren't yet so terrible. He watched with fascination as Cyrus began adjusting the knobs at the top and was surprised to hear the strings come back to some semblance of a beautiful sound. It took time. He watched in fascination as Cyrus carefully plucked and tuned every string, seemingly listening for a note that Eamon couldn't hear. He breathed when Cyrus ran through each of the strings to produce its melodious sound that he had heard on occasion. A thought then seemed to come to Cyrus, and he cleared his throat. Oh, <clears throat> your, your grace. David heard you'd summon me. He asked me to give this to you. It pertains to the request to send more healers from the Citadel. He pulled out a piece of folded parchment and held it out to him. Eamon took it with some curiosity and unfolded it. There were two pieces of parchment. The first one was a simple sentence. Lord Peter Baelish has tapped my man, Vicente, to spy on his behalf. He shivered. Already up to your old tricks again, I see. He thought. Cyrus had thankfully moved to a chair within the room and began dragging his fingers across the strings. A peaceful, gentle tune filled the room. And that was in contrast to the constricting fear that Eamon felt around his heart. He walked over to the fire in the grate and tossed the first parchment in. His eyes moved to the egg. If his dragon hatched now, it would be vulnerable. Danny had had trouble with interlopers trying to steal the dragons as babies. While they were worth more alive than dead, he shouldn't risk the dragon's safety, considering its importance. Maybe it's for the best to keep it in the egg for the time being. He had to survive Baelish first. The other parchment was indeed a letter to the Citadel to request healers to be transferred to the keep. Eamon was keen to keep his people happy. But he could see the healer was at his wit's end, dealing with all of the commoners who desperately needed help. David was looking for trainees to learn his craft and hoped to offer it to any hopeless students at the Citadel. He had mentioned to Eamon that the Citadel would be less than thrilled to lose students for his cause, so Eamon himself vowed to write to the Citadel as well. The Citadel relied on patronage from the nobility and the throne to keep it running. He could use that leverage to encourage the Citadel to fulfill this request. He sat down at the writing desk in his room and allowed himself to sink into the brief, pleasant moment as the music swirled around him, and then he began to write.